Um, so whilst uh, Woody is um, connecting to everything, uh, I will kill a little bit more time. Um, I do have some more icebreakers, but I might actually just uh, spare you those. So I'm curious, everybody, you, you've come to a, a session around open banking, and we've looked at user cases. Whilst uh, we are just getting the, the technology sorted out, has anybody got any great user cases for their own businesses they would like to share? Now is your 15 minutes of fame, or rather a couple of minutes of fame. No? Okay. So this, uh, this section is entitled the Neobank Stack. And when we are up and running, what we will do is try and go through this presentation. Uh, it'll be 20 minutes, and then we will uh, take questions at the end. So the speakers work very, very hard to put together their presentations. If anybody's done any public speaking, it is, you know, it is an awesome task to, uh, to stand up here. So if you could think of some questions and engage with your speakers, that would be absolutely wonderful. Are we ready to rock? Yeah, how was that for killing some time? Sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, Woody, thank you very much. Thank you. Doesn't work yet. Mm. Doesn't show yet. I'm gonna wait for a few. Are you, are you able to do it without a presentation? Do you want to give everybody a little overview of what you do, your company, and the great things you've achieved? And if you can squeeze any user cases in there, you'd make me very happy. Thank you. Sure, but uh, I, I was planning on doing that after the short intro, but... Uh, but you, uh, whatever you want without a presentation, you're off piece now. Okay. How many people are from large uh, financial institutions in the room so I can gauge a bit the... Not all the people, okay. I have some flattery coming up for banks uh, in the beginning of the presentation, so I was hoping for more people. But um, see if it plays good. sorry, see, see, see if it plays good. If it plays, see what they say. Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to wait for for a minute uh, for the slides, otherwise I'm going to miss uh, my track. So we, so we keep on time. Would you just like to say a little bit about your business so everybody? Um, can know what you do and maybe a little bit about the role that you play as CTO? Sure. Okay, so my name is Woody. I'm um, the CTO and co-founder of CPOs. We are a French company, a uh, startup, and we work with banks, with fintechs and scale-ups as well. Um, we do both an agency business, which means that we conceive and develop applications uh, in fintech, and we are also ourselves a fintech since we've invested in building products, some of which I'm going to to present. Oh, well done, the technical team. Thank I'm you. I'm just missing the, the remotes, and then it's fine. Amazing. Thank you. All right, so I wanted to, to start the talk with a, a bold statement that is not very popular today, is that bankers are heroes. Um, and I wanted to do a refresher about that, because we're going to speak about new banks and what they do very well. But I think it's important to realize that banks also have constraints that these new banks don't have, and I want to have a, a refresher about that. And the first big constraint they have, of course, is that they have to deal with legacy that new banks don't have. I just put a figure uh, for a, a large European bank uh, has 1,400 different IT initiatives. So when you compare that with uh, Monzo, which has hundreds of microservices, it's not the same challenge that they have. And when we look at what they try to do about fighting this, uh, this legacy problem, the first generation of core banking system they tried to replace, only 30% of these projects succeeded and they're forced to stick with main thread cones, some of which comes from the 70s and some of which people wouldn't touch with a stick. So it's a, it's a big constraint. And the second one, of course, is also that uh, those large banks can't make mistakes. The stakes are very high. Um, this is the number of the, the amount of fines in pounds that they got in Europe in 2018, mainly due to KYC, uh, AML, and, uh, and um, th those fines represent a very large amount. And the stakes are very high as well when you look at the number of transactions per year. This is 91 billion transactions just last year in the euro area. So they, they're really heroes because they have these constraints that other actors don't have. Some of them were mentioned before. Of course, you have uh, the fintechs and the neobanks um, when, I, when, I, when I look at the market in France, N26 has outgrown uh, the main uh, online banking in, in France, which is Boursorama. This was created 
10 years before, and now N26 has more customers than uh, Boursorama in France. And so the, the neobanks, of course, have the main advantage to get the basics right and to fix the basics. Then, of course, there are the GAFAs and the BATXs. Uh, when you look at Eng Financial, um, who's, who's with, uh, of course, um, Alibaba, the valuation is very high. It's, it's the fintech that has the, 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 the highest valuation in the world today. Apple is doing the Apple card, Google Pay. It's been mentioned by Eric before, so I won't go into detail on that. And the last actor, which is less mentioned as well, is the traditional banks who are getting into retail. And uh, when you look at Goldman Sachs, uh, I was reading an interview by the CEO. He says, um, we have a big advantage is that for the retail IT that we're building, we're starting from scratch. We don't have this legacy that the traditional banks have. And they're starting to do partnerships with, uh, with the GAFAs as well. It's, it's, a big, uh, it's a big threat for banks. And so where do we come in? We, we work with all those actors. This is uh, the, the intro I did before. And what I'm going to try to do in this talk is to try and summarize to us, uh, by working with startups and large banks, what makes really a, um, a new bank, what makes a tech company in general. And we've summarized that in three main characteristics. The first one is that there's a real obsession for the customer. And I'm not just talking about customer centricity. It's really an obsession that uh, the whole company must uh, live on a daily basis. The second factor is that when we work with banks, we usually see that the main concern is speed of delivery. When we look at neobanks and what they do and the different talks they give at conferences, they are really focused on quality and making sure that the apps they do is secure, robust, and performant. And a third aspect, I won't go into detail with that because I'm a bit short on time, but it's really the idea of being, of spending a lot of energy on attracting the best talents. And, and luckily, by doing the first two characteristics, it has a big and positive impact on the way you recruit IT talents. So for customer obsession, I've gathered two uh, main tricks. And one of them is for the product manager. One of them is for the CEO, actually. And when we, when we look at the job of the product manager over the ages, the first, um, the first way of them to do their work a couple of years ago was really to go into a room and only using assumptions to create products. And it didn't work quite well. So they started to actually do user testing and to, uh, uh, to really go and see users on any feature that they would build to be sure that their assumptions was right. And now their job is getting a lot harder. We've spoken a lot about open banking. And today, they, product managers are not just managing the journeys and the interfaces they build. They're also managing the platform and the APIs. This is a, a short, uh, it is a, a small extract of a, of a conference by NewBank, which is a new bank in South America. And this is the different uh, bricks that you must have when you're building retail services. So there's a lot of different bricks, some of which are going to be in any new bank. I'm talking about authorization, KYC, some of which are going to be very specific to uh, the, the, the market that you're trying to reach, uh, for instance, rewards. It's something that not all new banks do, but this one did. And so the, the product manager must be able to really understand the way this is split. And this uh, microservice splitting was back in the days only done by tech people who were responsible for defining the different modules and how they interacted with each other. But now the PM must do that. So when he's building user journeys, he needs to ask himself uh, a, a few questions. Uh, what really matters in the case of the product I'm trying to build for this specific journey when I'm doing a KYC, what is really important? And because we're living in the open banking era, he must also ask himself what already exists in the market. Who are the best players? Can we get some inspiration from the best players? Can we possibly use products to, 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 to build our own uh, version of the, of the journey? And to identify for each of these actors, what do they do well, what don't they do well? And based on all these factors, are we going to build it in-house? Are we going to buy it? Are we going to do a partnership? Are we going to uh, get only inspiration to, to build it in-house? And these questions are exactly the same today for FinTech APIs. When you're building uh, a new bank, you need a core banking system, you need a KYC, and you have to know who are the actors in, the, in these different uh, bricks in the market, and are we going to use them temporarily or forever, and, and this is something that the product manager must be able to do. He works at building a platform and not just interfaces anymore. So if we take the example of KYC, um, what we encourage product managers to do is to pick only four important characteristics for choosing the KYC API they're gonna use. 
uh, for the KYC example, usually we have accuracy, which is um, how are we going to accurately detect fraud for people trying to go through the KYC. Um, do we have some figures about this APR regarding false positive, false negative? A second important matter is of course the UX. Are we going, to, by using this KYC solution, are we going to see uh, an improvement in the drop-off rate of our customers going through the journey? So it's a, another important aspect. Compatibility. Uh, when we are building KYCs for B2B use cases, we know that some of the people running the KYCs are going to use old browsers. And does this API uh, or this journey provide uh, good compatibility with, uh, uh, with these different browsers? And finally, integration, which is something for me that is, should always be evaluated when looking at APIs. Uh, a, a very easy test that I do when I try to test uh, an API is to ask any developer to just spend five minutes in the documentation. If it's Stripe, you can be sure that the developer is going to be very excited about using this, uh, uh, this API. Uh, but if they feel like the documentation is not very good, it's usually a good sign. It, it only takes five minutes to figure out basically if an API is going to have good documentation, uh, good customer support, and is going to be easily integrated in applications. And so by, by really studying the way product managers should work, We've invested in, uh, in a product at CPOs, which is called Argos, and it, it references not only customer journeys, well, this is the example we took for uh, account navigation in new banks. We are referencing the best players, Monzo and 26, uh, Quanto in France, but also the APIs that uh, we can use when we're building a retail application. And in this case, for the KYC, uh, in France, we know we recommend Abel, uh, which is a, a video KYC solution, which is more accurate because the, the, the ID card is captured through video and not photos. Uh, it has great UX because of that, because people don't uh, send pictures that won't work in the KYC. It gets evaluated real time. And so we really try to do this exercise that allows product managers to be backed when they make choices. Um, we have these characteristics for these different APIs and journeys, and we are able to evaluate them based on what works and what doesn't work. The second uh, trick and, and tips that we find by working with new banks and startups is that the CEO should really be a helicopter. And when we look at the job of the CEO, it's usually uh, well accepted that he must have the vision of the business. He also must hold the different KPI of the company. For a new bank, we have a number of customers, we have the customer acquisition costs, we have the revenue generated by the new banks. But what we've seen the CEOs do that larger banks don't do is that it's really a matter of being able to move from the strategic uh, side of the company to really what happens with the customer. And, and this is really what I meant by customer obsession. When we worked with uh, the CEO of Quanto, which is the largest uh, neobank for, for businesses in France, we've realized that he wasn't really obsessed with the product or with the tech. He was obsessed with customer complaints. He, he spent a lot of time just looking at tickets on Zendesk or, or support system. He spent a lot of time listening on calls that their teams were having with customers. And the good CEO must really be able to move between what really matters for the vision of the, of the company and what the customers are always saying. And being able to do that on a, on a, on a regular basis every week, um, it allows really to have a vision and to, to have a business that grows. And I, I'm sure you can ask yourself, when was the last time that my CEO actually looked at a customer support ticket? And it's quite rare, even for startups we work with, the CEO tends to move away from these stuff and to more look at the products and the tech. But it's for us key. The second, uh, the second aspect of, uh, of the Neobank stack is more of a technical one. So half of the talk was, uh, was very product related and the other one is very tech related. And for this, we have three important tips uh, that the new banks do very well. And the first tip has to do with the, the software factory. So how do we build um, something that makes it easy for developers to deploy in production? Because they're sure that once they do that, it's not going to break anything. So we define a software factory that is pragmatic and easy to set up. So you have, of course, the code that ends up being deployed on a, on a staging server. You have collaboration that is very often done in, in, uh, in, in new banks. Uh, the fact that every feature is code reviewed and that pair programming helps developers work together. And then you have different layers that make quality built in the way we develop features. So the first step, of course, is testing. So typing, linting, and automated testing of the features and of the APIs that we build. 
And then you, you include extra steps. One has to do with quality. Uh, a tool that we often use is um, Sonar Cube, which basically, for, for the tech people, uh, it's probably a well-known uh, well tool, but it analyzes the code in a static fashion, and it just allows techs to understand quality problems before the introducing and staging. Then we have security, and for that we use three different tools. Uh, one is called SNCC, and it allows to detect vulnerabilities uh, due to dependencies that were not updated to avoid the, the Equifax uh, scandal that you, you may have heard of uh, in, in the past, past few years. Checkmarks does a bit the same as Sonic Cube, but it's it allows developers to see the vulnerabilities they've included in their code and to do some pedagogy to teach them why what they coded was actually a vulnerability. For instance, a, an unsecure API, well, Checkmarks is gonna be able to notice that. And we finally add an agent to the code, which is called Screen. And it's, it's, it's quite an amazing tool. It allows to basically protect any API of attacks. So if someone tries to do an injection or brute forcing, Screen is gonna be able to block these attacks without, uh, without have you having to make any modification on the code. And finally, there's performance. And for performance, we add another layer of testing, which is called Gatling, which does both response time testing and scalability as well. And App Dynamics, which allows you to dig in when you have performance problems, where in your application the problem is coming from. And the main perk in, uh, in, in, in setting up this continuous integration in this software factory is that you, um, you really put quality first in the eyes of the tech. And you, you're not talking about speed, you're talking about making sure that what they deliver is working properly, it's not gonna cost bucks for customers. The, the main three goals that I've seen in the software factory is that you create what we call DevSecOps team. It's DevOps, but with security added, basically. Um, the second important part is to create really a right first time culture. We're not talking about solving bugs, we're talking about really understanding why we're causing bugs and why we, how we can prevent that from happening again. And finally, the software factory helps removing these impediments that techs feel when they don't have the test set up and they can't produce an added test to, to protect their application. And so the software factory is quite easy to set up with these tools and it allows really to create this culture of quality in a, in a, in a banking application. Second aspect, I'm going to, to go a bit quicker on that, but it comes really from the realization that when you build application, especially with microservices and third parties, um, you need to understand that no one can be trusted. Uh, you can't just go thinking that things will work, they will eventually fail, and neobanks have really spent a lot of energy into finding the right patterns that protect their application from outside failures. So if we look at a traditional case that we, we see very often in banks, we have a, a client who is trying to, to do, for instance, a transaction and who contacts customer support because the transaction doesn't work. What usually happens is that the customer support calls the IT team to say something didn't work for a client, can you check out why it didn't work? And the IT team usually spends hours in the logs trying to finally realize that the core banking system had a failure last night. And what's even worse, it's that then, of course, the IT team is gonna say customer support asks your client to do the operation again, it's now fixed, is that we have two problems here. The first problem is that, of course, it took hours for the, the tech team to realize what the problem is. And the second problem is that because we weren't expecting the core banking system to fail and we weren't planning for it, the API probably hit the core banking system many times and make, made it even worse and because it was an unhealthy dependency that wasn't checked correctly. So what the new banks do, and this is very well described uh, again in, uh, in new banks conferences, I'm gonna put the, the link at the end, is that they use a system where it's very event driven when you look at new banks stacks, where when the API is trying to communicate with the core banking system, it's first going to publish in a queue the transaction that we're trying to send. And then if the core banking system is not able to actually process the transaction, it's going to push the request in what we call a dead letter queue. And the dead letter is a queue of requests that weren't probably processed. And it's very different because now the tech team doesn't have to be reached by customer support. He can just look at the dead letter queue to see what wasn't processed last night and to put it back manually in the queue for the transaction to be processed correctly. And so it's, very, it's, it's much easier then for the IT team to actually uh, make the application move forward and not uh, put more bugs in the customer. And there are a lot, a lot, a lot of patterns that Monzo, um, New Bank, uh, Revolut have put forward, some of which I've, I've written down here. There's a great talk if you want to dig in more into these, uh, these different patterns that make the applications more robust. Uh, this talk is, is quite uh, interesting uh, by Monzo. 
the last, the last uh, trick uh, we have for ensuring quality is uh, generators. And generators is something that is very efficient. That is, some banks are actually starting to invest in building generators. Generators are basically programs that generate code. And to do generators, we usually do it in three steps. The first step is standardizing. For instance, if I'm trying to create an API that is documented, which are the mistakes that we can't make? Can we provide to new developers examples that work and examples that shouldn't be uh, replicated? Then you have the tooling. So you're going to take this standard and you're going to automate the creation of this code. So for instance, two, two tools that we can use to create these generators are Yeoman and Plop. And so you're going to create either generators, library, or reusable components that allow you to, to go faster when you're coding, but also to make sure that the code that you're pushing forward is right first time, because it's the standard version of the code. And finally, the last step that is key is training, because if you have generators that developers don't understand, they're going to be working with code that they don't understand. So it's very important once you've built a generator to make sure that each developer in the team is actually able to reproduce the tasks he was trying to, to perform without the generator uh, before allowing the tech to use the generator. And so we've done that uh, at CPOs with our onboarding generator because we've realized that the onboarding of a fintech application, which includes the KYC, is often uh, quite uh, long to code and can be error prone. So we've built a generator that takes a JSON configuration and generates a React application that is a full onboarding and that includes the KYC, the auto-completion of information, and which allows low drop of rates. And, th and this is an approach that banks can take internally, creating generators to go faster and to avoid quality issues. And so to summarize, uh, those are the two main aspects that we think are part of a new bank stack. If you do that, you can, uh, you can move to the third step, which is to attract more developers and to move from Superman to the Avengers with a large team of uh, of tech people who are ready to, to, do the, to build the best retail product because it's really about this. How can the bank compete with the new banks? Uh, and I think it looks more like this than Superman today. Thank you very much. Good final um, ending there because uh, you have been our Superman because that really was a presentation worth, worth waiting for. Anybody that has stood up here dreads the IT failing. You handled it with a plum. Thank you very much. You. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, first of all, he's, he's earned his beer this evening, but could we have a few questions? Has anybody got any questions? It's um, um, stacked full of content. I'm sure um, there must be one or two. Okay, well, could you put your hands together and really show your appreciation, because he works so hard. <laughs> and he, if, just, just to not lose his cool right at the beginning, you are our speaker of the day. Thank you very much.